Okay, thanks for the opportunity to talk here today. So I'm just gonna say a little bit about health impact modeling of transport, particularly urban transport, some of the methods that we use, some of the challenges that we face. First of all, contextualizing it. Obviously the world is rapidly urbanizing, cities and transport systems are changing in many countries quite quickly. The kind of policies, the strategies around land use and transport, they have long-term consequences and unfortunately within this health evidence is rarely considered though we know that transport has important implications for population health. So what are those implications? Well, there is a major burden across the world for air pollution, of which a substantial proportion, it varies a lot by setting, comes from um, transport. The, the largest burden generally in most places is from fine particulate matter, with around 9 million deaths estimated for globally from the recent study from outdoor air pollution. Noise, there's a growing evidence base around the harms of noise. Um, <coughs> and a lot of that comes from traffic. Traffic related deaths on directly on the road from uh, collisions, from traffic accidents. Uh, sorry. You just reduce it to them. Yes. Or, uh, Sorry, the other one, the one. One. We just will remove the uh, So slide. I hope you don't see my dream. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Sorry for the so yeah, I mean, the most obvious uh, burden is probably around traffic collisions and its estimates are that over a million people are killed directly on the roads every year with a huge uh, burden also of ser serious injuries, many of these kind of can be life lifelong, uh, life-changing injuries. And what is the pointer button now not working? <laughs> <It's> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so let me see. Yeah. Does it work? Yeah, okay, yeah. yes. And then transport can be a great opportunity for physical activity from walking, cycling, other forms of active transport. But in many, uh, in many places these are not easily available to people and so the design of transport systems can contribute to the growing burden of physical inactivity. Transport is called also course an important contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and this has uh, important implications for population health over a different uh, time and geographical scale. So th this is talking about the burdens, about the health impacts of transport systems as they are at the moment. But it's not sufficient to provide these kind of descriptive statistics of national burdens. We also we need estimates of what would happen at the city level, often even the sub-city level, if, if, if travel changes. And for this we need simulation models that can synthesize the best evidence and data. And what we've seen in the last 10 years is a growth of models and tools designed to do this for academics and policy organizations. And in my experience, organizations, what they want is they want rapid answers, they want comparable estimates between cities or ways of comparing across different places and they want to know how confident they can be in the results, how robust are the findings. I've been recently working, for example, with WHO in Ghana, C40 cities in Bogota and Texas, Air Resources Board in California, UK Department for Transport, OECD Safer Cities, WHO Heat Tools, so there's lots of different initiatives or programs trying to do these kind of city level subs or scheme level comparisons of uh, transport and perhaps um, perhaps comparing against interventions in other areas too. So when we think about these kind of simulation models, this is from a study we did a few years ago now where we looked at these visions of transport for England and Wales and compared kind of current practice against a kind of European best practice kind of vision here and a few other different scenarios and we modelled 
health impacts, in this case, to changes in physical activity through air pollution, traffic collisions. And in this context with these scenarios, we found that far the biggest impacts would be from the gains in getting more people are physically active from the walking and cycling, with some important gains from uh, traffic collisions, but much smaller. In this context, not much impact from air pollution here. Um, and this is just to give an example of one of the kind of studies. And as I say, this has formed part of an emerging literature over the last 10 years. And you know, I've contributed to a few of these different studies. And what we're seeing here, pointer, maybe I should point the cursor for the audience. Um, can I do that now? So in green, these are all scenarios looking at health impacts of a mode shift towards active tra travel. And uh, they've done quite different scenarios, but all kind of roughly some kind of similarities. And the gains are, they're all normalized to 100%. And we see the gains in terms, this is from a systematic review about four years ago now. We see the gains of, in green of physical activity. In red, we're seeing traffic collisions, changes. In some cases, this goes up. In some cases, up. In some cases, it goes down. In dark blue, we're seeing air pollution impacts. And they vary quite considerably between the studies. And these are the gains in the general population of reductions in background levels of pollution. And these, and only some of the studies have done it, are the impact on the active traveler of uh, changes in air pollution as well. So this is the evidence base a few years ago. We're just updating this review now to look at um, you know, how the literature has changed. But while this has been a you know, important field, important, you know, important development with all these new studies, there are some major limitations too. And I mean, the, the health impact modeling studies, they use quite heterogeneous scenarios, different kinds of evidence. They vary in the data, they vary in the methods. Now, I think this could be turned into a strength. But at the moment, the problem is the implications of these differences is poorly understood. So we don't know what's driving differences between the studies, really. We don't uh, have much understanding. We just know that they, 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 they differ. Um, and the evidence, or the, the studies haven't often defined well, and this is beginning to change, um, the use cases. What, what all, there's been no kind of topology developed of the ways the models are intended to be used. What are the kind of um, thinking of use case? I mean, I spend a bit of time talking about it, so I won't take it too long, but thinking about the models in, in, in context, thinking about the user, the kind of data they have, the kind of question they're, they're asking, um, the, the context that they're in. And I think it's really important to start kind of proactively and um, perspectively defining use cases to um, before comparing models, and we need to have that to cover kind of structure around this. I, got, I, I can't spend too long on that point. Important other limitation, and I'm not going to say much about this, but I could talk about it more if people are interested, is that the work is largely occurred in, in, uh, in, in silo, in isolation from developments in transport modeling. And there's a whole kind of separate field around transport modeling that has not really been linked up to, to this, and um, I think that's an important gap. And, Perhaps most importantly, most of the studies have been in higher income countries, although the burdens of transport, in terms of air pollution, in terms of noise, um, uh, in terms of road traffic injuries, are much greater in low and middle income settings. Uh, and, and we really need to have models that are applicable to those settings. And when we think about going out of and the kind of higher income settings, or the relatively limited number of higher income settings, then of course things start changing. There's much higher there's air pollution in some of the cities, but of course there's much greater variation, and there's variation in sources of air pollution too. Um, some cities have much higher injury rates, but again, there's, there's big variation here. Um, there's a different traffic mixes, um, even between, of course, you know, you, you know, UK and the US, you'll have a different traffic mix, but of course when you start going to India or something, you'll get a different mix again of vehicles and people, and um, <coughs> even in some context, animals and so on. There's differences in things like non-travel related physical activity. People are doing more manual jobs or they're active in other domains and domestic activity. Then this may affect the, the, the benefits and the harms. Um, Non-communicable disease burden differs um, in terms of obviously of you know, rapidly growing diabetes in, in places like India, India and China. But you know, you'll, you'll get a, di a difference for, for, for 
various reasons to do diet, smoking, uh, early life experiences, and so on. So there's these important uh, differences and things that we have to think about when, when going outside the kind of European, US settings, where, and Australian settings where many of the studies have been done. Now, I'm just going to say something now about three projects that I'm doing or have been doing that I think are sort of interest here. The first one is TIGVAT. And TIGVAT is a two-year project. It's just about to come to an end at the end of next month. Uh, and this is a kind of mid-sized project about laying the foundations of a um, transport and health assessment tool. And it's a foundation grant. It's about global challenges. It's about doing things for low and middle income countries. Um, and it's not about creating this all single dancing model, it's about kind of what's the work that we can do that can help get us there. The second one is um, a new project that hasn't started yet, it's a European Research Council Consolidator Grant. This is a kind of bigger project over five years, and this <coughs> is about developing that model and a few other work streams as well around. And the third one is a small project. This is, for, again, for Global Challenges Project. It's a six-month project, or it likes to be five months. Um, and it's about using image data to, with machine learning to measure and understand the built environment and people and vehicles and how they operate within it. And it's obviously not trying to solve those problems within that, but it's doing some workshops, some other things as well. Um, so take that. This has been an international, multidisciplinary team of experts with uh, domain-specific expertise and about trying to lay the foundations of this globally applicable user-friendly health impact model um, that can support evidence-informed decision-making. And we're doing a lot of things in the project, but we're going to have case studies that we've done as cities in, um, in Delhi, Bangalore, Vishakhapatnam, uh, in South America, Sao Paulo, Campinas, uh, Buenos Aires, um, Cordoba, Bogota, Mexico City, and we've also just recently done Accra, hopefully soon doing Cape Town as well, but that may move into the next project. So we're trying to get a range of different cities where people haven't been able to do this health impact modeling before, and then to do some comparisons across them to understand what's driving the differences in results between them, or what data are most important in the different settings. So GLAST, which is the ERC project, which will be starting very soon, is these three work streams. The first one is about comparative modeling. It's using kind of statistical uh, methods to look across when you've got the different models to compare across the models and across the use cases and to investigate where uncertainties matter most. So to understand where our data gaps are biggest and where perhaps we should prioritize new data collection or new analyses. And I think that's really important to have that kind of framework. <coughs> but I can't say much about it now as I'll run out of time. Um, and I think these value of information, you, you know, it's easy to focus on one area, improving your estimates of one area that you're most interested in, perhaps. What you need is to think, well, what uncertainty is most important for the question I'm asking? And to use, um, you know, use kind of scientific methods to try to prioritize uh, your further data collection or research to, to, to reduce those uncertainties, not the ones that perhaps you're most familiar with or the ones that you're, um, is the next step, it feels, in terms of your research. The second work stream is around the integration of health into transport models. I mean, transport modelers use um, <coughs> activity-based models, land use transport interaction models. These have become a lot more sophisticated, a lot better at representing activities. They have some limitations in representing tra um, active travel behaviors. They're better at motor vehicles, but people are working on improving that. How can we integrate health calculations within them? They do this to a very limited extent so far on air pollution, but uh, and noise, Occasionally, but usually this is directly monetized and not represented as health outcomes properly. And um, I think there's an opportunity here to to try to have represent physical activity uh, and more more perhaps more importantly to think about how can we use the very rich spatial and temporal detail in these models, the representation of daily activities, of where the vehicles are, to um, to see how well we can model health outcomes in this kind of very data rich if, if synthetic um, setting and then to see to say how important is that richness does it make much difference to the results if we have this level of detail 
And the third one is around building on the TIGDAP project and, and building this global city level model and working with both traditional and with new big data to, to estimate relevant exposure patterns for cities across the world. And just to go through very quickly the, the different steps that will be part of that um, work stream three. I don't know, people are not going to read this, are they? Yeah. And maybe I should skip this for time anyway, because I think probably it's best to get on with it. So, I'm just going to say something now on the Global Challenges Research Fund project. Um, this is, as I say, a, a short project that um, is only went to the end of July. Collaborator with Professor Carola chun at the Applied Maths Department. Okay. And it's got partners at NC Tech, the um, camera who, who developed kind of um, uh, uh, cameras for uh, 360 imaging, um, C40 cities, uh, who are um, climate coalition of cities trying to tackle climate change and interest in the health outcomes associated with that. Professor Xiaosheng from TU Munich, um, Daniel Fuller from Newfoundland, um, and Professor Banerjee from Indian Institute of Technology, <laughs> Delhi. And there's going to be a workshop in Cambridge on uh, image data, thinking about how can we use image data to try to help understand uh, transport, uh, vehicles, peoples and their, and, their, and their interactions and thinking about questions about collection of data, ownership of data, different kinds of data, the different kind of questions that we can ask of the data um, and to really to a kind of multidisciplinary approach and bringing these different groups, different groups together approaching it from very different ways and thinking about satellite, um, fixed camera, mobile camera as well. And I mean, this is something that hopefully people, uh, you know, I'd like to put an invite out for people from Bell Labs to be involved in as well. And there's going to be a workshop, uh, there's going to be a hackathon, two hackathons, and there's going to be some extended visits from um, Chao Sheng's uh, students, perhaps Daniel's students as well, to be working on um, some, uh, with, with some image data that comes out of this, as people like, you know, NC Tech and other people who've done road safety work are going to provide us with some data as well as satellite data that we can also of course access ourselves that they've been collecting or testing their cameras or doing evaluation of road safety, road safety work. Um, I'm now just going to say a few things around health impact modeling methods and data and some of the some of the ways that we approach that. And I mean this, can people see this? Okay, so this is about kind of schematic of the kind of data that we'd have, that we have or we need when trying to do the kind of health impact models at the city level that we've been developing. So we often, one of the key things is around travel surveys. We need something about personal travel data. How do people travel? And often we use travel surveys for that. It's not the only way, but it is the way in which we use. We were also interested in, that gives you amount of walking and cycling, as well as car use and so on. But you, people, are active in other domains too, so you want something about non-travel physical activity, gym or sport or domestic activity and so on. And together you get a physical activity model. Um, you want something on injury data, this can come from police or hospital data or other things, to know how many road traffic collisions there are, what the different vehicles involved and so on. Um, you then need to combine this with something on vehicle data, so you've got personal data here, You've then got vehicle data, which either comes from the personal data directly or from also with other counts or model data to give you some kind of injury simulation model. Um, your personal travel data <coughs> and along your, gives you something about your exposure in traffic, um, you know, about your travel to air pollution, and combined with your vehicle data, you can develop uh, and your baseline measures of air pollution, which comes from concentrations, either measured or measured. <coughs> Um, you have an air pollution model. And then you say you've got your three models here, and then these are combined together through the simulation to give you um, an integrated assessment of health outcomes. It's a simplified schematic. Uh, and now I'm just going to say something on each of the, those three pathways. I'm not going to talk about noise, though it is something we're increasingly doing as well. So for physical activity, 
Physical activity reduces the risk of a wide range of different health outcomes. And there's good evidence from systematic reviews, meta-analyses, linking um, changes in fit or li linking levels of physical activity to what we'll cause mortality, cardiovascular diseases, heart disease and stroke, diabetes, dementia, total cancer, but also specifically breast cancer, and lung cancer, uh, depression. So there's strong evidence here and we're um, work with our colleagues who do the physical activity epidemiology to keep on improving the evidence, the evidence base here. When we think about physical activity, you need to think about uh, how to combine different activities and have a measure of the total activity of a person. And the usual way that is done is thinking about you know, intensity, how, how intensive is the activity, how long, what's the duration of the activity, and what's the, the frequency, how many kind of bouts of activity you're doing in a week. And the intensity, we usually measure this thing called marginal uh, metabolically equivalent tasks, which is sort of the intensity above resting. And so walking might be three or three or so, walking with a load might be kind of up to five, cycling, cycling maybe five or six, running might be, depending on how fast you're going, 10, 12. Of course, it depends a bit on your fitness and, and so on. And then you can get a measure of marginal meta hours per week, which is the kind of total volume of activity that you're doing. And this can be got from self-report or from the objective measures. And we've been working, and this is work in progress still, with this dose-response <coughs> meta-analysis. And so this is looking at the relationship between, from, these are from self-report studies, but we've done an awful lot of data harmonization. It's not finished yet, but I think it won't change much between levels of physical activity and marginal met hours per week. So, I mean, that would be about an hour cycling, um, and this would be, I don't know, four or five hours walking per week. And what you see when you've got the further dotted line here is both the relationship has become a lot more flat at the higher levels of activity, but also what we're trying to indicate is it's a lot more uncertain. I mean, these are confidence intervals, but I mean, this is a, I mean, this is a cubic splines that we've fitted here, but in a sense, you, you're sort of, this is where we fitted the final spline, in a sense, you're just assuming a kind of straight, continuous relationship, um, you know, without any further inflections beyond that, beyond that point, because, um, you know, the bulk of the evidence from the studies is, 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 is down here, so you can get some very weird relationships if you start um, focusing too much on the studies there, often which are maybe be supporting too. So um, beyond, the, and essentially that is about twice the W, the, or it's the higher WHO recommendation level. So I don't know if you know about the idea of doing, um, you know, kind of 150 minutes a week and more of vigorous activity, and that would be about here, eight or nine, and then that, so that would be about um, the higher recommended level. Uh, this is captured through uh, diaries. This is, this is from diaries, yeah, in which physical activity surveys and people have been followed up over time from cohort studies and they've um, suffered, well they've died in this case, but or they've suffered from different diseases and we're doing a dose response meta-analysis across a wide range of different diseases including some mental health outcomes as well. Um, we have then, what we've done particularly here in this study is harmonising a lot of different instruments because they report it in very different ways and you know ideally over time when harmonize this to objective data at the moment it's kind of harmonizing the different kind of self reports but you've got one study measures it in counts or one study in you know one study measures it in marginal met but another just says how many times per, per week did you do this and you have to think about how to combine all these different instruments together now what you see here of course is this non-linear dose response relationship here with the biggest benefits between the here and here and so if you think about a population distribution of activity, then this is here under a baseline and under these high cycling scenario for England, England, yeah. And the people here who were not doing any activity would get a much bigger benefit than the people up here who are already quite active and a small increase in their physical activity will probably have very minimal health impacts for them. So, you need to think about the distribution of activity in a population. You also need to think about the age and the gender too, and socioeconomics and other things. To think about who is, how much total benefit there will be. Because if you're changing the inactive, you get a bigger benefit than you change the active. You also get a bigger benefit if you're changing the older people, because older people have higher 
event rates. As you get older, your chance of also developing heart disease or diabetes and so on increases. So the same relative reduction will lead to a bigger absolute reduction in, um, in events. <coughs> but we also have to think about all, I want to estimate kind of city level data, population data and population distributions. And I have to think about how all the different kinds of data fit together for this. Because what data do I have? Well, I might have a bike counter, you know, or some kind of traffic counter or something, or some image data. I might have a travel survey. I might have a physical activity questionnaire, which is what is used in the etiological studies. Ideally, and in the newer etiological studies, and this is what they're doing in Biobank, you might have, you know, an accelerometer and you measure <coughs> kind of movement. Now, of course, better than that is to measure movement and heart rate. Then you actually have probably a, you actually have a really decent measure of the physical activity of a person. So you've got to, you've got in a sense this kind of levels of quality of data, but you've also got to think about how you move between these different data because some you may only have for a very small population, while others you might have for a big population. So you can't just say, oh well, we just want to use the best data because that's not going to get you anywhere. But you want to think about harmonising up rather than just going to the lowest common denominator and. I mean, for me, it's important to think about how we work between the etiology and the surveillance measures. Because the etiology is used, what's used in the studies to estimate the relationship between disease and outcome. But then the surveillance is what you use to estimate the levels in the population. And you have to make sure you think about these two together and how they work together. And that's, that's one of the challenges that we have. So, air pollution more than well, I mean, there's lots of different air pollutions that are interesting and are harmful for health. I mean, the biggest focus is on PM 2.5, fine particulate matter, um, as this seems to have the, the most important uh, harms. And, um, you know, it's associated with a, with a wide range of yeah, adverse <coughs> events. Um, PM 2.5 concentrations across the world. Now, a lot of this comes from modeled data, particularly around Africa, most of this is modeled data rather than for um, monitoring stations. But you obviously see that, you know, the, yeah, some very high levels of air, air pollution there. And, you know, I know it's, it's obviously is a concern here and there is increasing evidence that even at what's low levels of air pollution, there are important harms for health, but of course, um, it's not really where the greatest burdens are. What do you have mid, uh, the central parts of Africa? Um, you've, also, you've got the Sahara. Uh -huh. I mean, the, 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 the dust there is, as well as, I mean, it, you have obviously got pollution from the. This is two, uh, two point five, right? Yeah, but you have got the Sahara is making a big difference to that. Oh, okay, interesting. Burnett uh, paper that shows, you know, uh, an even stronger relationship than was, was done previously, and this is, this is the kind of the latest evidence, and, um, yeah, with what's coming up with those very high figures for the burden of air pollution globally. And interestingly, physical activity and air pollution affect quite similar diseases, and, I mean, of course, all cause mortality, we use that a lot for modelling, it's often the simplest to work with, but cardiovascular diseases as well, diabetes, certainly for physical activity, and probably for air pollution, Okay, dementia, I think actually air pollution may be affected by dementia in some recent studies. Lower respiratory effect infections, probably not affected by physical activity, but who knows what we'll find out. Cancer's probably a slightly narrow range for air pollution than for physical activity. COPD, probably physical activity does affect COPD risk, but the evidence isn't that well established at the moment. Um, mental health, well, that may be different here, but you see there's a lot of overlap in the pathways between the two. And so, um, quite interesting in terms of the trade-offs and thinking about that and we've done some modeling looking at the trade-offs of being active in polluted environments and generally for most people most of the time it does pay to be active even in a polluted environment. <coughs> um, the air pollution modeling around cities you can think often of two approaches depending on your um, scenarios and you can either focus as I showed you on that slide early on on well if you're thinking about more active travel and less car use, you've got fewer cars, you've got less pollution. Or you can think about, well, but people have been active in a polluted environment, so uh, they're breathing in more air pollution. And you can model, of course, you can model both of these, but depending on your scenario, depending on your kind of question, one of these may be more important than the others. Because if, you have, if you're only imagining a few people taking up cycling, you probably have a significant change in cars, and so why bother to measure the change in concentrations? 
um, well, if you're measuring mode, it, but if you've got a big city-wide changes in transport systems, then of course that's likely to, do, to, to dominate as well. And if you've got mode-specific ex exposure, you need to think about things like route choice, uh, road position and ventilation rates. And of course, the more active you are, the more air you're breathing in, the higher ventilation rate. So the same as your physical activity benefit is also your air pollution harm as well. And uh, that is unavoidable. While, but of course, the road position and route choice, there are potentially some changes around that, as of course is the actual background level of air pollution is itself that can be affected by that. Um, by, by here too, by what's happening with the traffic and the other sources. Now, in the UK, a lot of you know the focus is on traffic, and rightly so. There's also concern about wood burning stoves and things like that as well. But um, in other countries, of course, it can be a lot more complicated around what's causing air pollution. I mean, if we're looking at um, India or something, then you know we're talking about traffic, power plants brick kilns, household cooking, industries, waste burning, I mean, all important sources of particular matter. So um, you can't just look at the transport. And uh, here the vehicles is causing about 30% in Delhi of the particular matter. So it's important and the road dust, well, you know, it depends whether you want to call that with traffic or not, and kind of use suspension and things like that. But you know, there's a lot coming from other, other sources as well. And, um, Within the vehicles, of course, you've got a big mix, and you've got heavy goods vehicles, lighter, lighter goods vehicles, two wheelers, you know, four wheelers, cars, three wheelers, buses as well. So, um, it, it's only around 30% that's by two wheelers and cars. So only about of of this, so only about 10% of particulate matter is coming from uh, two wheelers and cars. So if you think you had a passenger transport intervention, you're only going to make I'm not saying you should do it, but you're going to have to do it. You've got to work across all the sectors if you're going to try and tackle those kind of air pollution in those cities, and you have to be realistic about what's going to be achieved um, by doing it in just in, in, by, by policies just focusing on that. Um, yeah, I mean this is sort of repeating a bit what we had before, but I mean this is so yeah this is showing you here the monitoring stations, and of course <coughs> you see here the massive global inequalities and just the huge huge gap of data that we have around Africa and some other parts of the world uh, 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 as well and um, of course how that then relates to the the estimated model levels of air pollution um, where we're seeing such very high levels but without you know robust and reliable data to be sure that this is the case but of course as the models improve we can at least have a better estimate so hopefully use that to put in some better policies to, to tackle this where we can now I'm um, just going to say something on traffic injuries. Now, mostly we use a kind of what I call a risk and distance based model for estimating injuries. Um, and looking at the traffic burden, okay, it's not come up quite so bad here, but it's kind of very, very blurred there, sorry. Um, in terms of the Traffic injury burden, there isn't, I don't know, can people see that at all? Yeah. Maybe it's better for you because you're further away. <laughs> um, the traffic injury burden, um, we're seeing at the top the kind of uh, African, uh, the African regions, then Latin America, then some Asia, uh, a a Asian regions, and of course um, Europe actually does you know, relatively well down, down at the bottom. We're also seeing there's some quite considerable uncertainty in terms of the traffic deaths per per 100,000 because uh, the quality of the data varies quite considerably as well. We've also looked, of course country level tells you so much, we've also been here some comparisons between cities and again these are fatality rates per 100,000 looking at some different cities, we're seeing London and Paris at the bottom here and then um, through to some Indian cities, or so, so, sorry, um, Bogota, American and, and then through to some Indian cities. Um, and you see in some of the Indian cities and also in, in Cape Town and stuff, the huge variation in um, some LMICs that we're seeing in terms of the traffic fatality rates. But it's not just the total fatality rates, of course, that differ. You've also got to think about what the makeup of the victim profile is. And what we're doing at the moment is a study comparing um, we're comparing this, but also, I'll come to the next slide, the striking vehicles. 
uh, in different cities and different data sets across the, across, uh, the world. And you see here in Indian cities, uh, where we've got a mixture of pedestrians, cyclists, and then a lot of two-wheelers. And then um, the car, again, a lot, of, a lot of pedestrians, quite a few two-wheelers. Um, while if you go over to the US cities, of course, what you're seeing is cars. Particularly in US, most US large cities, we're seeing over half of the, uh, the victims with the cars. Uh, and similarly, also in some of the Chilean, it, it, it's in the regions in Chile as well. So there's a big variation in kind of um, whether it's mainly kind of what we call the vulnerable mode users of pedestrians, cyclists, and two wheelers, or whether it's kind of car occupants, of course, depending on the, on the traffic mix and the speeds. Um, in, in those cities. But it's also interesting to look at the other vehicles involved in collisions as well. And this important, forms an important part of the kind of simulation models because if we're assuming that there's an increase in say walking or cycling, well, and changes in car use, well, what are the vehicles involved in collisions? If it's because if the people have been killed by buses or trucks, then the changes in car use is not going to um, have such an implication for, for, for road safety. And of course you get a big mix here, the difference between cyclists and pedestrians, I can't show you all the figures that we have here, but um, here we're seeing you know, the, the, the two wheelers, and I mean two wheelers often are disproportionately involved both as victims and as, stri as striking um, vehicles. I mean we've just done some analysis for England, and yeah, I should have maybe brought that as well, it's quite interesting some of the findings that we're getting there. Um, I mean, if you look in London, there's not many two wheels, but they're quite high. Um, the US large cities, of course, um, it's almost all cars because there's very few. I mean, they dominate so much the, tra the traffic and they're quite large, the cars as well. Um, and you get a slightly different pattern if you look at cyclists, where larger vehicles are perhaps disproportionately more involved as well. So, in developing these injury models, we take account of all the different vehicles involved in the collision and the different victims, and then we say, well, okay, we've got to change the distances by each mode, and what does that mean in terms of the change in, 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 injury, in injuries? And, um, <coughs> this is, we also apply these kind of non-linear factors when doing this, because it's, you, you need to, yeah, um, a change in distance doesn't directly change into a proportional change in injuries. And, I mean, here we're seeing it for cyclists from some route level analysis we did in London, and that as the numbers of cyclists increased, so the uh, injury odds fell. So you would get um, perhaps more total injuries, but the risk per cyclist fell. And uh, there was also an equivalent analysis done for vehicle volume, motor vehicle volume, and you find that there's a non-linear relationship as well. So um, going from a small to a a slightly higher level of vehicles had a much bigger change than going from a high to a very high level. Um, when doing the work in LMICs, one of the big issues is around the data. I mean, how many traffic crashes are there? How many deaths are, are there? Traffic crashes are, you know, highly underreported. Deaths are more likely to be recorded. But even this varies across settings and across the sources of data. Uh, I mean. It would take a long time just to talk about the different kinds of sources of data and the biases they have. But, I mean, in most settings, serious injuries, minor injuries are very underreported. Serious injuries quite a lot. Deaths in somewhere like the UK are pretty well reported, but in some settings you may make, you're reasonably happy if you've got half the deaths recorded. Um, and you often have to mix between hospital data and police data, and they're both of their limitations. So trying to have a decent estimate of the, the fatality rates and, ideally, the mode, the demographics of the people, the other vehicles involved in the collisions is extremely difficult. Uh, the cities are slightly better in the countries, but uh, the countryside, but um, like not always as good as you would like, should we say. Travel patterns. I mean, as I've indicated, this is a really important uh, input to health impact models. And I mean, traditionally, what we've done, and we need to think about how we can go beyond this, is relying on population-based representative surveys, typically one-day diary. In, you know, in England, this is done every year, and it's good for the national level. In London, we have a separate one. Um, but it doesn't tell you about every city. And you know, people keep a diary of all the trips they did. And I think this is quite a good way of collecting data, but you know, we do need to think about new ways of doing this. Uh, and in many places, they unfortunately don't exist. But um, if you look at, this is just to give you some travel mode 
shares from different surveys have done around the world, of course, you see huge variations between the levels of walking. I think, you know, 66% of trips of walking in a car are in Nashville, they're at 7%, you know, kind of cycling, 29% uh, in Copenhagen, uh, you know, Cape Town, there doesn't seem to be any cycling, there is some cycling, I saw some, but there isn't, not enough that really registered in the survey. Motorcycling use, Bangalore at 31%, many places claim to have kind of zero levels of motorcycling, you know, most people captured fully. And of course, car use from 3% in Bangalore through to, you know, 90% of trips by car in, 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 in Nashville. And public transport up in uh, 40% in Sao Paulo, 36%. There's huge variation across the world. And these surveys are very helpful for us for understanding this. But I mean, these surveys, of course, have their limitations in terms of underreporting of short trips. Um, professional drivers are not really included. Minority modes can often be thrown into another. And you can have things like bikes and motorbikes thrown together and things like that. And they're about people, not about vehicles. <coughs> and sometimes walking to and from public transport is often maybe not included. But that can be in London, that's an important amount of the physical activity. It is recorded in London, but it's from walking to access public transport trips, walking to the Jews and so on, and buses. So many high income countries have national travel surveys. Um, other places, city or regional authorities often collect them. They don't always do them quite the way we'd want or as consistently. Research groups collect them, and we're just about to do a travel survey in Accra, in Ghana. <coughs> but, you know, this is of course done on a more ad hoc basis, small sample sizes. Um, and often they're just not available in LMIC settings. I mean, we've just been looking for them, and the, you know, they don't exist, or they're very you know, out of date, or very small samples, and even when they do exist, they can be hard to get hold of. One of the important issues, and this is important for all sorts of data, is thinking about people and vehicles and of course a travel survey would tell you, it won't give you information on the drivers, it will tell you about the people, people on the bus, um, you can think about buses, sorry, it won't give you information on the bus, it will tell you about the, the person, their trips and their mode, and it won't tell you about the vehicles. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking about injuries <coughs> or emissions, it's the vehicles producing the emissions, not the people. So you know, you, and there could be a hundred people or two people or people on the bus and you need to know about the, the bus make and model, etc. Um, and the injury risk, well, it's the vehicle, but it's also perhaps the driver. I mean, you know, younger men, for example, are at higher risk of being involved in traffic collisions. So, you know, knowing about the, the driver is going to tell you that, not about whether, what the passengers like. Um, so all of these things, so you need some of the limitations of the data. So, you know, where are we are in terms of the data? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of problems with it the data that we want. I mean, particularly trying to think about how do we model across the world. Well, travel surveys are not available for large areas of the world. The methods are often inconsistent. Um, traffic counts. I mean, where are they? Who is counted? What are, you know, it varies a lot. I mean, vehicle registration data. Well, we have been using that at times, but, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't tell you about the use of a vehicle and it's often out of date. So, of course, we're looking at new and emerging sources of big data. Um, and try, I'm not going to have long to say on this, but just to give, you know, touch on some of the ways we're trying to think how can this help us here. Um, image data. I mean, this is something I'm very interested in. We're doing this workshop where we're going to be looking at this, about aerial data from satellites, from planes, from drones. Um, and you can see large vehicles on this. Street view data from Google, the sources. Um, fixed camera data, CCTV, traffic cameras. Also, of course, phone network and app data, such as Strava or Google Maps, um, social media data, which of course a lot of people are working on it here, Twitter and others, um, Instagram and so on. But, of course, you know, if we're trying to think about surveillance for ongoing efforts, we've got to think, how transient is this data? I mean, are we trying to look at relationships that then we can say, well, now we understand the relationship, we can apply it. But if we're trying to think, well, we want to use this to replace a traditional data source for surveillance, then um, we need to know it's going to last, <laughs> and maybe the commercial provider will just take it down. Mm -hmm. And of course, the risk with smart cities is: do they just benefit the better off, and so on? What can we do that can be applied to, you know, to to, to, to low-income cities consistently as well? At least that's a that's a potential risk. I mean, mobile data has many pluses and minuses. It's dependent on the phone companies, distinguishing modes. I know people can do it, but it does have some challenges select population using networks, 
It tells you about movement, but not much about place. Uh, it tells you about the people, but not about the vehicles that they're traveling in, so it's travel survey data. Um, app data, like Strava, well, of course, it tells you about the mode. Great, but it's a very select population. Um, I think it's good at telling you about things like delays and route choice. It's expensive to get hold of, unless you can get, you know, to give you the data, but on a commercial basis, it's quite expensive. Google Maps, of course, they have amazing data with Android Google Maps data, but um, if you can get hold of it, let me know, because <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not made available. Um, satellite data, this is probably the most established, well established these data, obviously people have been using this for years, but it's getting increasingly possible to do more and more with it. Um, it's got pretty much global coverage, many time points, long-term co coverage, which I think is really powerful. You know, some types are easily available, there are other types of course you have to pay for. But, you know, you can see bigger vehicles. We've looked at it in relation to um, large vehicles and injury risk in India, but you can't see pedestrians, cyclists, and motorcyclists. And, you know, the angle, of course, affects potentially what you see. The fixed camera data, um, this is relatively available. Lots of information, uh, but of course it's not random where the cameras are, what they're looking at, the angle that they're at is, um, you know, not, is, is not random, and the data are often not stored. Um, people, you know, why, why are people, would people store all this data over time? So, <coughs> it, it, how, how, how can it actually be used in a more useful way? I mean, we did the little study in Google with Google Street View. Um, obviously, these are street level images affected by Google, increasing by other people, um, that I, we think are potentially quite useful. Um, for saying about traffic and about interactions within traffic. There is good spatial coverage with Google Street View, though of course most of Africa is still missing with really poor coverage. In some places are dated a lot more than others. But it does cover many places outside Europe and North America. Um, India and China are not, I mean I know they're sort of India's highlighted, but it isn't really covered in reality. Um, there, what we did was we did a study and we just looked at pictures and we said, well, okay, I mean, obviously these are different places, we looked at pictures in Britain and we said, can you see a motor bike, can you see a pedestrian, can you see a bike, can you see a, uh, a bus, can you see a car, etc. And we looked at selections of images for cities across Britain and we looked at the relationship of that to census mode share, yeah, from the, tra the census you've got travel to work mode share. Um, and we looked at some other measures as well and um, this is for cycling and we found you know a very good relationship we found in a for other modes there wasn't such a good relationship in the univariate model but when we came with a slightly more complicated multivariate model we could reasonably well predict the travel mode share from just counting the number of images and of course what you found is the ones that varied most are the ones that had the best predictive power. So the numbers of buses, the numbers of, motor, uh, the numbers of cyclists, which of course vary an awful lot between the cities. Well, almost everywhere you're seeing pedestrians and cars, yeah? Or certainly in British cities you are in some parts of the world. In US cities you might not see pedestrians. Um, street view, I mean, what's the pluses? In it? I mean, it has very rich data on people, vehicles, environments, and interactions. Um, for a street in time, it captures everything, but then where has it been done for? Even with, you know, Google, do they go always into the informal settlements and things like that? You know, is it capturing everything you, you want? I think it, it's complementary to other data sets because it says a lot about place. It doesn't tell you about movement. I mean, obviously you're seeing things move, but you're not, you can't see from A to, that they've gone from A to B, but it tells you a lot about that place and the, the vehicles in there and the people interaction within that place. And, you know, it is reasonably good coverage for some cities and over time, but not for others, so it's very arid. Um, of course, it's mostly on my Google, so there are challenges around its use. Um, of course, it's also got biases around time of day, day of week, season. But I do think those are mostly controllable for adjustable if you understand them and do some uh, further work to investigate how much difference they make in different kind of contexts if you do some more calibration work. One of the big things that's happening 
courses. With Google, if they're trying to use this user-generated content, so it's become increasingly easy for people to collect their own data. And we are working with people who are doing this, NC Tech, who are attending our uh, hackathons and workshop, and they've collected a lot of their own data, testing their cameras, and they're interested in using machine learning, uh, or they are doing machine learning with that as, as well, and be interested in working with us as, as, as well to understand what you can get out of it. Um, um, User-generated content, I mean, it's done by people who are doing destination marketing, like South African Parks, we met people who've done that for commercial purposes, but also for, sort of, you know, for marketing, uh, to get people to come to South Africa, and for Tonga, for both kind of cultural and for um, marketing reasons. There's others that are collecting data, but not uploading that. People in India are doing that, working with the government, but for regulation purposes, they can't upload it. There's a, the data has become, I think, quite easy to collect, but then there's this sort of storage and processing. So if we're thinking about what this can be used for, we need to think about you know, all of those different steps and the, the challenges there. So who will collect it? Uh, Amazon, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's lots of companies who are people who are traveling a lot of miles. Who are the people who are going to start collecting this in the future? Researchers, but we're never going to cover the world in that way. We go into these kind of budgets or those kind of vehicles these distances, but we can maybe do some of the validation studies to prove what it can be done for. Automotive testing companies offered and said, look, we can drive around cities. We, we drive around cities all over the world. Pay us a little bit of money, we'll just we'll stick cameras on them. But can cities do it themselves? Can there be a model by which cities actually see a <coughs> value in collecting this data for their own city? Will they get kind of, what feedback would they get from it? What, what would they get out of it? And I, I think there really is potential for partnership to collect data to understand the environment and, and travel behaviors here with this kind of data but we need kind of a new model maybe about how this is going to work. Um, okay, yeah, urban, just to summarize, urban transport major implications for population and health, I think I was going to add on the end of that sentence. Um, health impact models of transport have been developed, and I think, you know, it's an emerging area, but there's a lot of heterogeneity in how it's done, and uh, a lack of understanding of the importance of these differences, and we need to make this a bit more scientific. Um, the work's occurred largely in isolation from what's going on in transport modelling and the, the research has not followed the burden in terms of where the studies have been done. And we need to, you know, to try and tackle the challenges back to, to, for producing estimates in cities across the world. We need to think about image data, other big data, new methods to, to model, to estimate exposures and how they might change under, under our different scenarios.